I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. And it's a pleasure to welcome you today on behalf of the museum and our terrific partners at the Olga Lengel Institute, which is co-presenting today's program. We have an excellent group of panelists who you'll meet in a minute to discuss the topic of American political leaders in the Holocaust, what Americans did and didn't know and do in response to the Holocaust. Uh, and hopefully uh, you'll all walk away drawing some lessons from this history for our world today. Each of the uh, three of our panelists will each speak for about 10 minutes each towards the beginning of the program. And then we'll open up in a discussion moderated by Adam Hochschild. Adam is a journalist, historian, lecturer, and award-winning author of 10 books, which some of you may have read. His most recent book is Rebel Cinderella, From Rags to Riches to Radical, The Epic Journey of Rose Pastor Stokes. Uh, so Adam will be our uh, moderator today, and I'll turn it over to him in just a minute. Before I do, um, you should know that you are encouraged to please share as many questions as you have throughout the program, and we'll save them for a Q&A period at the end. Please make sure to put your questions in the Zoom Q&A box rather than in the Zoom chat. Without further ado, thank you again to our audience for being here. Thank you to our panelists for being here, and I'll hand things over to Adam. Thank you, Ari. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this program. Uh, I should say that uh, I am not particularly an expert on this subject, but it's one of great personal interest to me because uh, some members of my extended family died at Auschwitz because they were not able to leave Europe and get to safety in the United States. And I'm sure that's true for many of you who are listening today as well. Uh, the subject is also of immense interest to all of us because, of course, the issue of uh, dealing with refugees from oppression is still very much with this country today. So each of our panelists is going to talk for 10 minutes, then they will talk among themselves some, and then we'll have time to hear questions from you. Uh, let me, without further ado, uh, turn things over to the first of them, uh, Arthur S. Berger, uh, Arthur was a senior official with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for almost 16 years. Before then, he had a 25-year career in the U.S. Foreign Service, uh, serving on at least four different continents as I look at the list that he's given us here. So, Arthur, over to you. Thank you very much, Adam, and uh, thank you to my co-panelists and to the Museum of Jewish Heritage and the Olga Lengel Institute for co-sponsoring this discussion. I think as we begin, we really should take a look at the historical context. Um, at the end of World War I, many people within the United States and many members of Congress became more isolationist. They didn't want to get involved with another war in Europe. They did not want to get involved with uh, beyond the borders of the United States. So isolationism became the catchword, uh, as well as anti-immigrant between 1880 and the, first, the end of the First World War. There were many millions of people who came to the United States, primarily from Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and the reaction among members of Congress was such that they wanted to restrict it to certain quotas. So in 1924, Congress of the United States passed the Immigration and Nationality Act which limited quotas to 153,744,000 ,000 immigrants permitted worldwide. One half, though, were from the UK and Ireland. Now, not long after that period of time, the, the, the world um, confronted uh, isms of really difficult uh, uh, categories for well, we'll take a look at Nazism, of course, uh, spread in Germany, but uh, and its main character was uh, against the other. Uh, Nazism, though, was and anti-Jewish feelings were not only prevalent in Germany, they were throughout Europe. And what we find in American history is that anti-Semitism was widely prevalent in the United States as well. Um, in the United States, there was the German-American boom, which had even summer camps for kids. Uh, Henry Ford, the great industrialist who also owned the um, uh, Dearborn Independent, a weekly newspaper which spread anti-Jewish 
sentiment around the United States and the international Jew, which he distributed, which was based on the protocols of the elders of Zion, and which he distributed to four dealers around the United States so that they could spread the word. Uh, Father Coughlin, many of you may have heard of him, uh, a fiery Catholic priest who spoke on the radio and railed against Jewish conspiracies. And of course, there was Charles Lindbergh, who was an American hero, but he was also one of the leaders in America First Society. And then, of course, there were these so-called patriotic and nationalist societies that really were geared to stop immigration and fight against the other. Now, at this same time, at the end of, during the uh, Depression in 1933, we had two new presidents. Two, the president of the United States came into power. Uh, FDR was sworn in on March 4th, 1933. And just a little over a month before him, Adolf Hitler became the chancellor of Germany. Now, what we're gonna take a look at is also the reactions because once Hitler came into power, there were actions and uh, hostility against Jews. There were uh, uh, lots of uh, episodes of uh, people being beat up in the streets. And in 1933, in the spring of 1933, Cordell Hall, the Secretary of State of the United States, gave a press conference. But before he did, he sent a message to American consuls in Germany asking, give a reaction to, really give me something that I can speak about. And one of the things that they did say was for the time being, the um, anti-Jewish riots seemed to be easing up, but they were gonna get worse. And Jews at that time were being fired from the civil service, from, uh, from teaching, from public hospitals, and from a number of other uh, civil society organizations within Germany. Uh, Cordell Hall in his press conference just talked primarily about how things seem to be getting back to normal for the time being. Uh, it was a less than truthful press conference and it became a big headline though. Um, at the same time, within the United States government, President Roosevelt had uh, one member of his cabinet, Francis Perkins, the Secretary of Labor who served with Roosevelt till the end of his terms in 1945. She was also the first woman cabinet member in the history of the United States. She was the only one who publicly and in cabinet meetings and to Roosevelt fought for the rights of bringing Jewish refugees into the United States. There was no refugee quota within the Immigration and Naturalization Service, but there was a labor. Um, the Labor Department does, did say that uh, if someone was getting an immigrant visa, whether they would be uh, taking jobs away from Americans. Now, at the same time, in 1933, President Roosevelt appointed a friend of his, Breckenridge Long, who's probably uh, well known to many of you, Breckenridge Long was appointed U.S. ambassador to Italy. At that time, uh, Italy was controlled by the fascist dictator Mussolini. And as time went on over those couple of years when uh, Breckenridge Long was amb U.S. ambassador, he showed more and more of a sympathy towards the fascist leader. He was pulled out of there. And um, rather than going into oblivion, he became the head of visa affairs for the United States State Department. He was very openly anti-Jewish uh, and he did what he could. And my colleagues will also go into this as well. And, and I'm sure later during our discussion, we'll talk more about that. But he did what he could to try to make it more and more difficult for not just Jewish immigrants, but any immigrants to come into the United States. At the same time, as I said, there was this isolationist trend within the United States. Members of Congress were railing against the hordes that could come in and take away jobs from Ameri the real Americans. Um, there was a very difficult period, both in the American economy, as well as in American society. Um, there were, at the same time, there were American diplomats overseas in Europe who tried to do what they could within the confines of the law, within the confines of the Immigration and Nationality Act, to show some sympathy towards immigrants, and especially to those 
who were seeking, were desperately seeking refuge, especially Jewish, re uh, Jewish refugees. Uh, some of them, for example, um, John Wiley, who was the consul in uh, Vienna, Raymond Geist, who was in Berlin, tried what they could. But there were others, though, who did not want to do anything to try to help Jews come into the United States. Um, and the United States had consuls, not only in Germany and in greater Germany, once the Anschluss or the absorption of Austria into Germany in 1938 took place, but it had consuls in many of the other cities in uh, major cities throughout Europe until December 11th, 1941. Um, Japan, as we know, bombed Pearl Harbor, uh, on December 7th, 1941, December 8th, President Roosevelt goes to Congress and asks for a declaration of war, which Congress gives him. Um, however, he does not ask for a declaration of war against Germany. The feeling was within Congress and the United States, let's stay out of that war. That's not our business. However, three days later, uh, Germany declares war on the United States and the United States has no option but to have a war on two fronts. Um, I will now um, turn back to Adam to introduce uh, the next person. Uh, so thank you very much, Arthur. Uh, we now go to Blanche Reason Cook, uh, our next speaker. Uh, Blanche is the author of a wonderful three volume biography of Eleanor Roosevelt which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. She's also a distinguished professor at the uh, City University of New York. So Blanche, over to you. Thank you, Adam. And thank you everybody for being here at this very sad and tragic moment in the world. Um, I have a chapter in volume two of Eleanor Roosevelt called Silence Beyond Repair. And the silence um, really is, you know, the backbone of complicity and the silence enables atrocities and the silence um, is really virtually total. Um, and a lot of people historically have said, well, maybe Eleanor Roosevelt didn't know what was going on. But the fact is that Eleanor Roosevelt knew everything that was going on um, in Europe, uh, the, the great suffragist leader, Carrie Chapman Catt, was very close to suffragists all over the world and very close to suffragists in Germany. Rosa Manis, who was among the first of the activists to leave Germany and be in touch with Carrie Chapman Catt and um, Eleanor Roosevelt receives her uh, report through Carrie Chapman Catt and they launch as early as April, 1933. They, they launch a petition, um, a protest of non-Jewish women against the persecution of Jews in Germany. And throughout this period, Eleanor Roosevelt works closely with Car um, Carrie Chapman Catt and the one person who really protested what was going on, James McDonald of the Foreign Policy Association. And um, it's a really kind of extraordinary thing. Um, there are groups of activists, the American Friends Service Committee, the people around Lillian Wall and Jane Adams work with Eleanor Roosevelt and her friend, Eleanor Morgenthau to consider um, refugee support. Um, in August, 1933, Eleanor Roosevelt and Eleanor Morgenthau go to Lillian Wald's home in Connecticut to hear Alice Hamilton, great professor of medicine at Harvard, who's just come back from a three-month tour of Europe and 
gives of, of Germany and gives a stunning report about what is going on and how dangerous everything is. Um, but nothing is done. And there's this tremendous silence about what is going on. And one of the really hideous things is that the State Department went so far as to try to stop a Madison Square Garden um, protest against in, in 1934 against what was happening in Germany. Um, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who also never takes a stand, um, actually sends a letter of support to a Madison Square Garden, um, the new friends of the new Germany, a Hitler, Hitlerian rally. Um, so we look for what are Eleanor Roosevelt's, who are her allies? In this period, it's really a great tragedy to know that people like Bernard Baruch, who were very close to Eleanor Roosevelt and Eleanor Morgenthau, did not want to uh, be public, did not want to publicly protest what was going on in Germany because they feared it would create more anti-Jewish hatred in the United States. And what Eleanor Roosevelt does is she begins to support more and more public protests for uh, against bigotry in the United States, um, against uh, racism and against anti-Jewish hatred. And so she becomes very involved with Clarence Pickett and the American Friends Service Committee. And it's a really quite a stunning and hideous history, um, which remains the silence beyond repair continues until 1944 when Henry Morgenthau's um, extraordinary group of researchers issue, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm looking for the um, Henry Morgenthau's uh, wonderful report in January, 1944, which is very powerful and which results finally in the War Refugee Board and Haven. And I think that for, for heartening, um, there's Breckenridge Long, who his goal was delay, delay, delay. And the Henry Morgenthau's team picks him out. He is the really the enemy of refugee support. And finally, after that, January 1944 report, um, he is finally removed. Um, and the War Refugee Committee, in it, you know, functions. And Raoul Wallenberg in Hungary saves many Jews and the War Refugee. And then there is finally Haven. And we, I, I recommend that everybody read Ruth Gruber the great journalist uh, who wrote about Haven and this one community for refugees uh, that was created in the United States. But basically um, it is, it is a, a totally horrible story. And um, I'm not sure how much time I have, but uh, there are a couple of you have another two minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, so the ACLU and um, the ACLU promotes the activities with the League of Nations International Commission on Refugees. But one of the really great tragedies here is that FDR um, wants to be silent about what is going on in Germany. And he maintains that silence um, really until the war goes on. 
you know, really until World War II is ablaze. <clears throat> and it's, it's quite a hideous, um, quite a hideous story. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Blanche. Uh, we will now go to Rebecca Erbelding. Uh, Rebecca's historian of American responses to the Holocaust. She's written a book uh, called Rescue Board, the untold story of America's efforts to save the Jews of Europe. Uh, she also works as a historian, archivist, and curator at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. So Rebecca. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and thank you uh, to the Museum of Jewish Heritage for having me. Um, first, I need to say that my views are my own and my research is my own and I'm not representing the museum in this capacity today. Um, I think a lot of people have a lot of questions about FDR particularly. This is a program about political leaders. And so we ignore FDR at our peril and, and you all will come up with us in the Q&A if we don't talk about him. So I think it's important to say that of his, in his terms, he had two major goals, recovery from the Great Depression and victory in war, um, victory in World War II. And we can criticize FDR because sometimes leaders are leading and sometimes they are following public opinion. And at various points in Roosevelt's presidency, he's leading public opinion. He is pushing America in, in 1939, 1940, 1941, um, to get prepared for what he sees as an eventual war. But he is not pushing American public opinion to allow in more refugees or to do really anything um, to change how they are looking at the refugee crisis in Europe that then turns into a genocide. Um, he has two main goals, like I said, depression and war, and the issue of the Holocaust never rises above those two things. In terms of the American people, they actually have quite a lot of information about what's happening in Europe. Um, Blanche mentioned Eleanor Roosevelt's information, but in local newspapers, they know about the Holocaust or they know about the persecution of, of Jews in Germany as early as 1933. Some of the events that Arthur described are headline news. But in terms of mass murder of Jews, that really doesn't reach American newspapers as a plan as a plan that the Nazis had until November, 1942. Um, at that point, information had come out of Switzerland. It had reached Stephen Wise, the most famous rabbi in America. The State Department confirmed the message. And at the end of November, 1942, American newspapers were reporting that at least 2 million Jews had been killed in Europe already, and that the Nazis had a plan to murder the rest of the Jews of Europe. So from 1942 on, that is treated as factual information. Not everybody believed it, but it was treated as factual. And for more than a year after that, for, for pretty much the entirety of 1943, more and more information is coming out of Europe in, and it's treated as factual. Um, Americans are reading about um, people being murdered by gas. They are reading about mass murder sites. Um, they are reading testimonies from people who managed to escape in some way. Um, there are protests in the United States, largely led by Peter Bergson and the Bergson Group, um, the Emergency Committee to Save the Jews of Europe. Um, they have pageants in New York, in Hollywood Bowl, in Boston Garden, in Constitution Hall here in DC where I am. Um, and there's even an Orthodox rabbi's march on the US Capitol in 1943 uh, in October, demanding some sort of rescue response. So there's public interest and public support for the US to finally do something about this. Um, and at that point, the Treasury Department gets involved. Um, Blanche mentioned Henry Morgenthau, FDR's close friend and the Secretary of the Treasury. His staff is in charge of US economic sanctions and they are um, finally willing in the summer of 1943 to allow some relief agencies um, like the World Jewish Congress, like the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee to send relief money to reach Jews in, in Nazi-occupied Europe. There are lots of rules about this, but they're willing to let that happen. Um, but the State Department through in the fall of 1943 consistently delays sending this approval to Switzerland, to the people who need it. And at one point in December, 1943, one of Morgenthau's staff at the Treasury Department sneaks into the State Department file room on a Sunday morning, or I'm sorry, a Saturday morning, 
and discovers that not only have all of these delays been deliberate, has this the, the State Department's been deliberately delaying the issuance of the licenses that relief agencies needed to, to get money, but that Assistant Secretary of State Breckenridge Long, who Blanche and Arthur both mentioned, had personally instructed US diplomats in Switzerland to stop sending information about the Holocaust to the United States. That that information was getting out to activists and those activists were demanding a government reaction and some sort of government effort. So the State Department, Long in particular, thought if the American people don't know what's going on, then they won't protest. So the Treasury Department gets together and they write a memo. Um, the original title of the memo is the acquiescence of this government in the murder of the Jewish population in Europe. Not a typical government memo. Um, this gets then watered down and gets to Roosevelt. Um, Morgenthau and two members of his staff meet with the president on January 16th, 1944, and convince Roosevelt to create the War Refugee Board, announcing for the first time a U.S. policy about the Holocaust, a policy of relief and rescue, and Roosevelt tasks this agency to do whatever it can to try to save Jews in Europe, um, sufficient um, or consistent with the successful prosecution of the war. So they can't do anything that gets in, gets in the way of the war effort, but they should do everything they can to try to rescue the, the Jews that remain. And so for the rest of the year, and really until September 1945, when the agency shuts down, so about 21 months, um, this group of people try as best they can in everything they can think of to save lives. So in 1944, US policy completely changes to being one of relief and rescue. Um, they streamline the licenses that relief organizations use to make it much easier to send relief money into Europe, um, eventually approving about $11 million in 1944 money, so 160 million or so today. Um, to a whole host of, of purposes to create false papers, food for children in hiding, um, paying off border guards to help Jews escape into neutral areas. And they really use the fact that the allies are likely going to win the war um, to their advantage. So convincing the governments of Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, and Turkey uh, to allow more Jews over their borders, to protest what the Nazis are doing, and to pass on intelligence about what their diplomats are seeing inside Nazi territory. Uh, they launch a propaganda warfare campaign, sending radio broadcasts and leaflets, um, warning would-be perpetrators, particularly in Hungary, um, against participating in these atrocities. Um, they send, as Blanche mentioned, they send Raoul Wallenberg, the now famous Swedish businessman, uh, to Budapest, um, particularly to, to do whatever he could to rescue Jews there. And we know that he um, almost certainly saved the lives of tens of thousands of people in Budapest. They start ransom negotiations with the Nazis. Uh, the Nazis are looking around and seeing the same landscape as everybody else, that, that the allies are likely going to win. And so some high ranking Nazis, including Adolf Eichmann, think, well, maybe we can get something for them. And so the War Refugee Board participates in these negotiations and really tries to string the Nazis along, saying you cannot um, murder this group of people because we will pay for them. Of course, the US is never going to pay ransom, um, but they managed to string a group of high ranking Nazis along for about seven months, uh, including getting about 2000 Jews out or 1600 or so Jews out of Bergen-Belsen and into Switzerland as a, as a good faith gesture on the part of the Nazis. Um, they open, the War Refugee Board opens the Fort Ontario Emergency Refugee Shelter, which is the subject of the book Haven that Blanche mentioned. Um, this is a, a, about a thousand mostly Jewish refugees who arrive in the small town of Oswego, New York in August 1944 as the only group of refugees brought outside of the U.S. immigration process during the war. They are housed in this small town. The kids go to public school, um, but the adults are not permitted to work in the town and they are kept behind barbed wire until the winter of 1946 because the US government, once they're here, can't figure out what to do with them. And the War Refugee Board sends food packages, about 300,000 food packages into Europe in the final weeks of the war. So disguise them as Red Cross packages and gets them into Dachau and Ravensbrück 
and Sachsenhausen and all of these camps. So if you've ever heard a, a um, survivor give testimony about receiving a food package towards the end of the war, that package was almost certainly um, packaged on Long Island, shipped across the ocean to either Southern France or to Sweden, disguised there as a Red Cross package, and then delivered in the final weeks of the war to tens of thousands of Holocaust survivors. Um, at the end of the war, the War Refugee Board wanted to continue. They said they tried to convince Harry Truman that they were not done, that the, the refugee problem was not solved, that now there are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of displaced persons in Europe, and that they, with all of their connections and governments in Europe and within the US government, were the best people to try to do something, to help. And Truman said, no, you are a wartime agency. We are going to shut this down. So in September 1945, the War Refugee Board shuts down. And uh, they estimate that they had saved the lives of tens of thousands of people um, and, and assisted hundreds of thousands of people in the final year of the war. So it is a very different history than the histories that Blanche and Arthur described, but I think that that change is really instructive as we look at how consistent activism, how interested government officials, um, how Congress, how all of these agencies actually can work together, that change is slow, but it is possible um, even after years and years of, um, as Blanche said, complicity or um, b neglect at the very least. So I'm going to go so, because I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, so now we have a few minutes for talk uh, among the speakers, and I guess I would like to ask the three of you first, um, do you have questions for each other? Did anything that one of you said prompt a question for another? I do, and I'd like to um, uh, no. address Rebecca. Uh, Becky, uh, you know, when you talk about the United States government, well, Morgenthau, uh, having this report you know, on the complicity of the US government, the murder of Europe's Jews, um, toned down a little bit. I think he was shocked by the title, not just the 17 pages of uh, yeah. chapter and verse of what the State Department was doing to stop Treasury from getting this money and aid to uh, refugees in Europe. But at the same time, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was holding some hearings because mm -hmm. there was pressure within a small group in Congress to try to force the administration to set up a refugee assistance agent. Yeah. Uh, and one of the people who testified in closed hearing for them was Breckenridge Long. Mm -hmm. And he testified that through his goodwill and through the work of the State Department, many hundreds of thousands, I think over 500,000 Jews were saved and brought to the United States, which was a lie. Yes. Um, he was exposed when it became public, uh, he was exposed. And that's when he was fired finally. And I think he went to ra you know, raising racehorses after that. Uh, but the one question I have for you, Becky, is that over the previous several years, you take a look at the um, Evian conference in July of 1938, uh, the Bermuda, skipping a few years ahead, the Bermuda conference, April 1943, in fact, on the day that the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising began, there were great appeals to Roosevelt to either change American quota policy or allow some special way of allowing refu Jewish refugees to come into the United States. And there was one example where he did allow 12,000 or so uh, German Jews to stay in the United States. And that was um, right after Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when it when hundreds of synagogues and Jewish-owned shops were, were destroyed throughout Germany and Austria. And he took five days before he had a press conference. I, I just can't imagine today any American president waiting five days after a major international event to hold a press conference. But there was some pressure on him to do something about the 12,000 or so Jewish Germans who were in the United States on tourist visas to extend that for six months, and he did. Uh, why don't you think he signed other executive orders? That's one. Mm 
Another okay. one was, of course, January 1944, establishing the War Refugee Board. But in between, there were so many opportunities for him to use the pen in an, yeah. executive, in a, uh, an executive order, which we know presidents use all the time now, but they did it then too. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> you were, your history was spot on, except for one unfortunate thing, which is that Breckenridge Long is not fired. You would think he would be, right? Everything that you said was right. He goes to Congress, he testifies. Um, th this, this moment of November, December, 1943 really sets up the creation of the War Refugee Board because there's pressure in Congress. Congress is being pressured by the Bergson group that I mentioned, the activists that I mentioned. And so their supporters in Congress introduced identical bills in the House and the Senate. Uh, to create this refugee commission. It passes the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and is scheduled for a vote at the end of January. So there's pressure there. Um, so there's this public pressure, this congressional pressure, and now pressure within his own administration. And Roosevelt liked to create agencies to fix problems. And so I don't know whether he really thought this was going to be an agency that had teeth or if he really cared or if he's really just solving a problem for himself um, in a lot of ways by creating the War Refugee Board. I think there is um, a sense from Roosevelt that he can't distract from the war effort. I, people have asked why he didn't create the War Refugee Board earlier. And I do think that he needs all of these things lining up, all of the public pressure, the congressional pressure, the pressure within his administration, remove any one of those. And I don't know that you have a War Refugee Board. But I also think that the war matters. Um, so often Holocaust historians don't pay attention to the war and war historians don't pay attention to the Holocaust. And in terms of lived experience, they're the same thing. Um, and I really do think that Roosevelt thinks at this point that the allies are going to win. And so he can get away with creating something like the War Refugee Board where, you know, not everybody may be fine with it, but nobody is going to argue that this is taking resources away from the war. We are still going to win the war. Um, I think it would have been great had it happened earlier, even if we didn't have the same leverage over the neutral nations as we did in 1944, because there are certain psychological things that happen when the country announces that it is our policy to rescue and provide relief. There are things that get bureau bureaucracy that gets aimed in a certain direction, red tape that gets cut in a certain way. Um, and that doesn't take a huge amount of government effort to do, but just stating we prioritize this um, would have been a, a really good move in 1938, in 1940, in 1942, all along the way. Um, but it is unfortunate that it takes him until 1944 to do it and that there are so many factors that really influenced that. Blanche, you know the Roosevelt's, Franklin and Eleanor, Eleanor better than any of us. Uh, any thoughts on what was going on in their hearts and minds during this period? Well. You know, it's really, it's so bitter. And I don't actually understand FDR's refusal to act. I don't understand his letter of support to the Nazi rally as late as 19, what, 38 in Madison Square Garden. And I don't understand, you know, Breckenridge, he, he keeps promoting Breckenridge Long from 1938 to the very end, Breckenridge Long is in charge of the entire State Department operation. So people like Dodd, who was um, for a little while an ambassador to Germany, he's protesting what's going on. And, every, and Breckenridge Long wants him silent. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's really a big puzzle. And Eleanor Roosevelt works around the, he tells her to be silent and she is silent. And this is one of the few areas where her silence is just horrific. It's, it's long lasting on the question of Jews. He asks her to be silent about race. Well, she doesn't, she refuses to do that. She's not silent. So she works with the NAACP and she protests um, the segregation of military troops. When she goes to England, 
she sees that there's no segregation among the British troops and she protests. And we know how long segregation lasts. Um, but Eleanor Roosevelt does protest. She protests different things. And here the silence is, is truly amazing. Um, she works with Hadassah. She works with various Jewish groups um, to build a spirit of harmony and love, as she puts it, so that you know the world as it goes forward will be more civilized. So that's what she does. But his silence and his activities are really, frankly, horrible and bitter. In I my do opinion. find it. I do find it. Um, I, I find Eleanor fascinating in this period because of her work with some of the refugee aid organizations. You mentioned the American Friend Service Committee, which of course was, was operating in Europe. And she was the honorary chairwoman of the US Committee for the Care of European Children, um, right. which, which brought children to the United States um, from Southern France in 1940, 41 and 42. And I, I found a letter uh, where and she wrote to Franklin. Right, kind of, yeah. yeah, it was kind of Absolutely. a, a proto-kinder transport for the US. I mean, you really need to mention Varian yes, Fry yeah. and the State Department's war against Varian Fry. And also his true. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's, I, it's quite hideous. I found a letter, and you, I'm sure you've seen it too, where she writes to Franklin and she says, I want to sponsor some kids. And he said, you can, and you can pay for them, but you can't keep them at Hyde Park. <laughs> they cannot come <laughs> and live at Hyde Park with us um, because he was, he was up for election. And, and those things, I, I mean, I think we, we tend to judge Roosevelt as a, as a humanitarian and he was a politician. And exactly. when you forget that, you are going to be disappointed. This was really and I, I think we do need to factor in a level of anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and race bigotry in the United States. There was one poll done in the very late thirties and another poll as late as 40 before um, the US is in the war, 83% of the American people did not want to support refugee um, activity, 83%. That's a very interesting point, but also uh, let me get to a diplomat that you mentioned in passing, Blanche, and that's James Grover McDonald, who was a very close friend of the Roosevelt, especially Eleanor. Uh, he was, he's practically unknown by any Americans, uh, but he, in 1933, he was appointed League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And he went to Germany. He negotiated with Hitler. He negotiated with the Pope. He went to Britain. He went to Roosevelt. He tried to get every possible way of getting Jewish refugees out of Europe and away from harm's way and yet he was stymied. So at the end of 1935, he goes to Geneva and gives a blistering speech to the uh, League of Nations, in the, which the United States never joined really. Um, and he tells them, I'm quitting because nobody cares about these people being killed. And I'll skip to the end of his time because in 1946, Harry Truman appoints him to the uh, Anglo-American Committee on Palestine. And he is trying to convince all of the British members and the American members to vote for in their final report to allow 100,000 Jewish refugees from DP camps to go into Palestine. And they all agree on this. And Roosevelt and Truman agrees as well. But the British government refuses to allow that to happen. Now, uh, James Grover MacDonald was then appointed by Harry Truman to be the first US ambassador to the state of Israel. And skipping ahead three years, when he left Israel in 1951, and the Holocaust Museum has this Bible that Chaim Weizmann, the president of Israel, gave to uh, McDonald when he left, inscribed in the front piece was to James Grover McDonald, the one other person who understood in 1933 that Hitler meant to kill all the Jews. Wow. Uh, 
We're getting some interesting questions coming in from the audience through the chat. So I'd like to turn to some of those. Uh, Lisa asks, I'm curious about the food packages. When they arrived disguised as Red, pa Red Cross packages to the camps, did the Nazis open them to see that they were food? Why would they have allowed it? Who wants to answer that? Uh, I mean, they stole the cigarettes, for sure. <laughs> we definitely know they stole the cigarettes. Um, what happens is, so I mentioned that the War Refugee Board was engaged in ransom negotiations. Those negotiations by February 1945 get turned over to the Red Cross um, because the Red Cross is looking for permission to go into camps and provide aid. They know that there are typhoid epidemics and that there's disease rampant in some of these camps and that mass killing has largely ended. Um, and so they are, the Red Cross is pressuring the Nazis to allow aid in those camps. Um, eventually, by the spring of 1945, the Red Cross has convinced the Nazis to allow Red Cross workers in the camps to distribute aid. Um, so many of the distribution of those boxes were actually um, done by Red Cross workers and the packages did not necessarily leave the hands of the Red Cross between getting from the War Refugee Board to the survivor, to the, the prisoner. Um, the times that they were merely shipping them into camps, um, survivors who were newly liberated found boxes and boxes in, in storage rooms that the Nazis had just not, um, not distributed but had stolen the cigarettes and the soap out of. Wow. Um, we know that they stole the cigarettes and the soap because we know what was supposed to be in the package. Wow. Uh, Alan asks, uh, can you discuss the decision not to, bomb, not to bomb Auschwitz or the rail lines leading to it? Who wants to take that one on? Well, I can start with it and then my colleagues can okay. uh, join in. Um, well, at that point, uh, towards the, it was really towards the end of the war. We're talking about uh, June, July, 1944. Um, the United States had the capacity to bomb Auschwitz. And if you go in the Holocaust Museum, you'll see blown up photographs that were taken from bombers at that time over Auschwitz. And I've talked to survivors, and I know that Becky has as well, uh, who have said that they heard these planes going overhead. You know, why didn't they do something? Why didn't they bomb uh, the, the, uh, the, the crematoria, the gas chambers? Well, there's an exchange of letters between the World Jewish Congress and the Assistant Secretary of War at that time, John McCloy. And there was an appeal, do something, try to stop this. You know, even though I think most people who understood war and construction during the war and destruction and construction, that even if the rail links were bombed, they could be repaired fairly quickly uh, and that the killing of Jews would probably continue. However, McCloy lied in that letter and you can read that online. He said it would divert us from our war effort and he knew full well. And when um, he was in fact interviewed on his deathbed about that, he refused to answer. Uh, he said that it would divert us from our war effort and it would not have because these planes were bombing Auschwitz III, Monowitz, the uh, rubber plant, uh, the, there was a possibility of doing it. Now, would it have really made a difference in the war? I have no idea. Historians are debating that still today. Another question comes from David. Uh, what about Jews around Roosevelt other than Morgenthau, such as Felix Frankfurter, Sam Rosenman, et cetera? Where were their voices? And I guess I would add, where were the voices of non-Jews who were horrified, as so many people were, by what was going on in, in uh, uh, Europe at that time? Was there a lot of controversy within the administration? What do we know about that? Um, one, one thing that's really very interesting is that Felix Frankfurter was um, at Oxford in 1933 and 1934. And there's a series, and he had relatives in Vienna. And so there are a series of letters that FDR answers everything in the letters except what Frankfurter wrote about the hideous things happening in Hitler's Germany. And though that exchange is really fascinating. He just, FDR just doesn't deal with it. 
He ignores his mentor completely. And then Sam Rosenman is very outspoken and FDR ignores his uh, suggestions for activity. Um, and FDR ignores everybody who is suggesting um, activity against Germany. It's interesting you say that about Rosenman because Rosenman actually puts barriers up in front of the war refugee board when they're trying to get to Roosevelt to do things. Rosenman will say, no, we need to water that down. No, you can't do that. It, right. it, I mean, it really is very situational. And right. I think it, it changes over time. It changes it based on the situation. It changes. And, and, and the voices that Roosevelt is listening to changes. Like in, in the history that I look at in 1944, 1945, Roosevelt, after he creates the War Refugee Board, is really not active um, because he's dying. I mean, he's spending so much time in bed. He is not well for almost the entirety of 1944. And so his, his involvement um, is minor at best in what the War Refugee Board is doing. Um, so I, I do think that it's hard to give a, one answer to who is he listening to, what are they saying, because even people who are sympathetic in one minute or in one year are less so later. Well, I, that's why the early period is, so, in my opinion, tells us so much more, because that's when he was active about many, many things, and he's getting a lot of input. And the State Department is, is, is not divided. The State Department wants to silence everybody who is supporting refugees. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and it's really interesting to see who FDR keeps promoting in the State Department. And, you know, when you get into it in the 40s, <clears throat> um, there's the war, <clears throat> but, the, the refusal to deal with what's happening is day by day ongoing from 33 to the end of his life. So I think yeah. you're correct, Blanche, because the, and as a former State Department uh, Foreign Service officer, uh, the history at that time in the State Department was outrageous. And you, even in uh, uh, Ambassador Dodd's book, you know, in Garden of Beast, you know, when he, when he talks about how um, when Larson writes about uh, how the uh, people who worked for him at the embassy, as well as in the State Department, in the, in the Bureau of European Affairs, how they made fun of Dodd. And Dodd, right. you know, came, he wasn't the first choice of Roosevelt's, of course, to go to, to Germany, but when he came back and he spoke to Roosevelt, and he didn't know if there was gonna be any kind of change at all. You know, he, he was not the right person for the job. That's another story. But there was another diplomat that I think we neglect um, and we should talk about more, and that is Jan Karski. He was not an American. He was a young Polish diplomat who escaped to England with the Polish government, and he had himself smuggled into the Warsaw Ghetto in 1942, and then to one of the transit camps where they were shipping Jews from uh, deporting Jews from uh, the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka to their deaths. And he was an eyewitness. He goes back to England. He meets with the British government. He tells them what he had seen. He, uh, a year later, he's the, the following year, he is in Washington. He meets with President Roosevelt. He meets with Felix Frankfurter. And he talks to them about his eyewitness of seeing what was happening that he said, they're killing all of the Jews, men, women, children, do something. He pleads with them. And when he comes out of, there's a, an oral history. And when he comes out of the meeting with Roosevelt and he mimics Roosevelt with his cigarette holder. And he says, I felt that he was going to do something, but of course he did nothing. Now, tell, uh, us, his, tell us his name again, Arthur. Jan, everybody Kar Jan Karski, K-A-R-S-K-I. He eventually came to the United States and became a professor at Georgetown. I was yes. honored to be in his class for a couple of them when he didn't speak about this at all. And many years later, I asked him, I said, Professor Karski, why didn't you tell us about all of these things in the late 60s when we were in graduate school? And he said, nobody wanted to listen to me. Nobody wanted to hear it. No, he was nobody quite wanted right. To hear it. No. I and mean, he wrote it's a book interesting. On that. Like, another one other even... influence that that on Eleanor Roosevelt, and that's Eleanor Rathbone, who was a member of parliament in England, 
who was chair of the committee in the British Parliament, the committee to save the perishing. And Eleanor Roosevelt was very close to a whole group of women in England. And so she gets all these reports and uh, there's a good biography of Eleanor Rathbone. So you can see there's pressure to do something and nothing is done. The British do nothing and the US does nothing. Um, uh, Rebecca, you mentioned that there were these public protests, which I'd not been aware of, you know, of Orthodox rabbis marching on Capitol Hill and so on. Was there pushback when things like that happened? Were there overt counter protests or was it a matter of people in the government just uh, quietly shaking their heads and tut tutting? It's, it's largely the latter. Um, mm -hmm. There are no counter protests that I know of, of mm -hmm. you know, when people are protesting for the US to do something. It will just be quiet letters um, and meetings in the State Department and in the government saying, you're not going to listen to them, right? <laughs> like, yeah. this is not this is not who we are. Um, but it's not just it's not so black and white anti Semites are are against action. And there's a split within the Jewish community too, as, um, as the Orthodox rabbis are marching in October 1943. Um, two members of the World Jewish Congress are in Breckenridge Long's office saying, you're not going to listen to these guys, right? Uh, there is a split within even the Jewish community over whether people should be out in the streets or whether they should be working behind the scenes in the government. And so all of these factors, I think, and I'm glad Arthur started out with the context of the 1930s because all of this is so important. Um, when we talk about the State Department and when we talk about US response in general, I think there's a tendency to give simple answers to a complex question, to say it was Breckenridge Long, he was just saying no, it was the State Department, they were just terrible. And those things can be true, but it's also the, the whole world in which they inhabited, the structures, the laws that they were told to uphold that were racist and anti-Semitic and nativist laws, um, all of these factors really have an influence on political leaders, which, which is why I think it's so important to study the Treasury Department and what enabled them um, to finally change the dynamic in Washington. Um, so if, if I can mention one thing though, in the 1930s, in February of 1939, there was a thing called The Night at the Garden. There was, it's a film that- Yeah, that's what watched. Blanche had been mentioning, yeah. Uh, on YouTube, I 20,000 Americans supporting the Nazis. Um, but and, the counter protesters outside, outside protesting counter them were more than the ones inside the garden. There were more people yes. attacking the Nazis than were Nazis. Yeah. And thankfully, I've never seen down. a figure that suggested there were more protests than in the garden. I've never seen that. Oh, I'll email you. <laughs> I'd like to see that. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. very heart heartening. No, there yeah. were protests outside. But the film is worth watching because the film it, is incredible. It's yeah, it's nightatthegarden.com yeah. for people who Re haven't seen it. Regrettably, we're coming up on the end of our assigned hour. So I'm going to have to thank all three of you very, very much uh, and just say how much of a pleasure and how enlightening it was for me to participate in this program. And I'm going to turn things back to Ari. Thank Arnica, you. I wish we could just add another hour right now because there's a lot more to get into but a, a huge thanks to each of you Becky Arthur and Blanche for sharing your expertise with us and Adam for facilitating this fascinating program uh, a couple things I want to leave everyone with um, one is that we so Jan Karski who you mentioned um, was featured in depth in Claude Landsman's seminal 1985 film Shoah we just announced today that we are going to be hosting the first in-person screening of Shoah in a decade here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage this June. It's over the course of two weeks because it's a nine and a half hour film, but we hope some of you who are in New York will come join us for part or all of the film and learn Karski's story and more in a little bit of detail. Um, I also want to mention that uh, the Olga Langell Institute and the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which are co-sponsoring, um, both host a, a rich array of programs and everything we both do is made possible through donor support. So for those of you who are watching and are supporters of our work, thank you so much. And if you're not and you're able, we hope you'll consider it. Um, we will, we did record today's program. So we'll send out a link to the recording tomorrow in an email. 
Uh, and we'll also include links to some of our panelists' books and a bunch of the other resources that were mentioned, um, including the film A Night at the Garden at the end. So uh, I'm sorry to cut this off, but great thanks to all of you. And we wish everyone a, a healthy and uh, well afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Great. Thank you.